Hello, I'm Emily Farkas here from CTSNet in San Antonio at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons meeting. And I'm joined by Dr. Ron Salinger, who is the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at the University of Maryland, St. Joseph Medical Center, and also on the executive board of ERAS, which is not Taylor Swift's latest uh, concert tour, but rather the enhanced recovery after surgery. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Dr. Salinger, you have a presentation here uh, this morning or this afternoon that talks about patient blood management, which is a topic that has been looked at frequently over the past many years. What was your initiative and why did you dive into that a little further at this time? Well, my talk is on how to get to a 10% transfusion rate for cabbages. And our journey towards that rate really began in 2015 and we were stimulated by our state quality initiative in Maryland. Okay. We looked at blood transfusion rates for all the programs across the state and our program was solidly in the bottom half as far as we were pretty liberal with our transfusions. We had, we had a transfusion rate of about 40 to 45 percent um, and we wanted to improve that and, our, and luckily our whole team was enthusiastic about it and that helped us but we've really started the journey then and and we were pretty rapidly able to make a lot of progress once we focused on it well, if we got from 40 to 10 that's that's fantastic progress isn't it when you were starting this initiative did you look at contemporarily what the rate of blood transfusion is for cabbage across the country is that something are you familiar with what that percentage is now we did, and uh, the the entire country is transfusing less blood for cabbages. I look at it and I forget it, but I think the intraoperative transfusion rate is 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 lower. It's like in the teens on average, and the postoperative transfusion rate for cabbage for just for packed red blood cells, I think, is like in the high twenties, like twenty eight percent, somewhere around there. So certainly, room for improvement. Every day is a school day, right? I think so. We we believe that we achieve equivalent if not better results with transfusing less blood and that we really do think that there's harm associated uh, with giving unnecessary packed red blood cells. So tell me about the key uh, factors and recommendations that you arrived at in your study. So the way that that we implemented using less blood was there's there's several pillars I like to call them of, of how we achieve this and we look at it as phase specific. Each phase of care, there's something you can do. Uh, Preoperatively, it really transcends all the phases is having a multidisciplinary team approach. And, and like I already mentioned, we were lucky in that we had people in every discipline that's involved in the care of our patients that were enthusiastic about being more conservative. So that helped. Preoperatively, the most important thing I think we do is we aggressively identify and treat anemia. And we treat it with IV iron and erythrocyte stimulating agents, which I think we have to be less reluctant to use in cardiac surgery. Intraoperatively, we avoid hemodilution. We're meticulous about our surgery, and we use a formal surgical checklist before we close. And then what, if a patient is bleeding and they need to go back to the operating room, we're big proponents of early uh, re-exploration if it's necessary. And we think you can decrease your blood utilization that way as well. We, again, we have this culture of conservation, and I think the biggest impact in transfusing less blood is what we call a permissive anemia. We tolerate severe anemia, both intraoperatively and postoperatively, and we have very narrow indications for transfusing blood. So we transfuse patients if they're actively bleeding or if they have really an extreme anemia, which we define as a hemoglobin less than six, but even then we don't necessarily transfuse them unless there's signs of end organ malperfusion. So really interesting, I bet everyone's thinking, okay, what are the exact triggers for these things? So you just mentioned one of them. Um, just to back up to the preoperative phase, which you said was one of the most important pillars. So using those agents and uh, prophylactically, if you will, transfusing to a satisfactory level. What are your triggers for doing that before surgery? Or do you just identify the patients? So we screen patients and we're treating anyone as a hemoglobin less than 13, definitely with iron. Okay. But our ideal thing is IV iron and an erythrocyte stimulating agent. Okay. Because of logistics, sometimes it's hard. We can usually get IV iron even for our outpatients. 
uh, ESAs are harder because, you know, if you have an outpatient that doesn't have renal failure, is not a Jehovah's Witness, then it's hard to get that paid for. Mm -hmm. Our inpatients are all getting ESAs if their hemoglobin is less than 13. And what's the difference? I'm sorry. Sorry. We also, based on the Lancet article, we also add in uh, B12 and folate for those patients. And the time frame to start that and to complete it before the operation? Yeah, it's a great point. So many people think maybe it's not worth treating because you have limited time. But there's been several studies actually shown in cardiac surgery treating 24 to 48 hours before still makes a difference in post-op transfusions. And so we use whatever time we have. Okay. With both the iron, the IV iron and the ESAs. Yes. Okay. And uh, in the intraoperative phase, so you mentioned hemodilution is a big issue. What kind of uh, real message? What, what do you do that people can take home and do tomorrow? Yeah, that's a great question. Hemodilution, the techniques you can use in the operating room are, are many, and there's a lot that are effective. But I like to focus on what's simple and what everyone can do and, and what's definitely effective. So one thing that's not hemodilution, but everyone should be using, if it's, as long as it's not contraindicated, is fiber analytics, which we use for everyone. And then really retrograde autologous prime should be employed and cell saver. And those two things are, are very well studied and make a big difference. The one thing I'd like to touch on is our, a lot of people focus on the hemoglobin trigger, which I think is very important. We like to call it a threshold because we don't use it as a trigger. Like if you get to whatever value you decide on, if you arrive at that value, we still like to have a physiologic component to deciding to transfuse. We use a very low threshold of six for hemoglobin, but you don't have to start there. You could start, most programs definitely could start at 7.5, which has been shown to be safe in the TRICS trial and would most likely still decrease their blood utilization. Okay. That's an interesting recommendation. Thank you. And um, did you have any problem with your perfusionist, your anesthesiologist, your um, perhaps referring cardiologist uh, agreeing with these thresholds pre and perhaps intra? That's funny. Yes, we have, there's definitely skeptics and people challenged us and there's not a lot of data to show, except for the data that I'll be showing in my talk, there's not a ton of data to show uh, that an extreme anemia is safe. Uh, so some people are nervous about it and we've had several talks with the team we just talked to people we've talked to our intensivists we've had intensivists that are nervous about it uh, a couple anesthesiologists we had a perfusionist that we we talked to but we also calculate our oxygen delivery on pump and we always go over with the entire team our results including our renal failure rates our aki and our neurologic complications which are the things that people mostly worry about when they're talking about anemia sure And you mentioned a surgical closure checklist. What does that entail? So, uh, you know, one of the early studies came out of the Cleveland Clinic, and there's been some good studies out of the UK showing that uh, compared to historical controls, if you have a formal checklist for bleeding sites before you close the sternum, you'll decrease your re-exploration rate. And the studies that are published about chop it in half. So it's pretty effective. And you're just looking at all the sites that probably everyone looks at, but you're just formalizing and make sure you don't miss anything. And, uh, you know, we start our checklist, we start uh, up in the neck, and then we look at our cannulation sites and any otomies made on the heart. Um, And then we look uh, down at the diaphragmatic surface to see if blood's pooling behind. We look down in what I call is the pit of despair, which is behind the left (laughs) atrial appendage. Uh, And we look at our proximals. Uh, I personally never, I don't lift the heart to look at my distals, but I think those indirect spaces that we're looking at will tell me if a distal is bleeding, if it's a cabbage. Mm-hmm. And then we look at our mammary artery. Uh, and then after the wires, we look at our wire holes in the mammary bed. And this checklist, is it uh, in your head? Are you saying it out loud? Is someone actually ticking boxes or? We say it out loud. Um, well, actually, I, should cur- I say it out loud. I don't know what everybody does. Right. Some people, some of my quieter partners probably do it in their head, yeah, but sure. I say it out loud. We don't have an actual ch- like boxes that we check, yeah, sure. but okay. we go through it. Okay. And um, after you close, uh, are you using any kind of point of care tag or any kind of gold directed? Uh, uh, that's a great question. So we do not in, in, in our practice, but I think that 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 has been shown to be effective at decreasing blood utilization, particularly in non-isolated cabbage populations and aortic surgery patients. So if you have patients that are 
more frequently coagulopathic, it's a really good idea. Sure. Okay. And uh, so then we get to the ICU. Perhaps you've eliminated some of the pushback because you say you share the results. You talk to your multidisciplinary partners about all of this. Your trigger is six, a hemoglobin of six in the ICU. And we're talking only about uh, red cells. So have you, is this all transfusion of all products or just pack red? Cells? We have focused mainly on red cells. The last year we have focused more on platelet use and not just transfusion of platelets, but uh, bringing platelets into the hospital because a lot of platelets we bring in as cardiac surgery programs don't get used and they, they get wasted. So we've focused on that, but we don't, and we've cut our rates a bit but we don't have formal recommendations around that. But, but it's a great point because that's, uh, I think playlists is the next place we'd like to go with some recommendations. Sure. We've given us a lot of interesting information that we can take and use, like I said, tomorrow or next week in our operating rooms. Are there formal guidelines or recommendations that will be put forward from your work? So we have the ERAS Cardiac Society is uh, just here at this SDS meeting, going to be talking about our 2.0 consensus guidelines, which also was done jointly with the STS and will be getting published in the annals. That will have patient blood management content, which is new compared to the original guidelines. Fantastic. So we can all look forward to the STS endorsed ARS 2.0 guidelines. Thanks so much for sharing it. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Emily.